Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew 5, verses 1 through 16. This is the New Revised Standard Version and can be found on page 4 in the New Testament portion of your pew Bible. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father in heaven. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Thank you, Phyllis. You had a lot today, didn't you? (laughs) Mm. Well, over the last few weeks, we've been tackling a tough subject through exploring Brian McLaren's new book, Do I Stay Christian? We started by talking about some of the challenges to Christianity today, particularly the growing movement of Christian nationalism which seems to hold beliefs so different than what Jesus taught. And then we looked at why people are leaving the church, including its history of hypocrisy and violence. Fortunately, Janaba moved us into a little bit more positive territory last week by exploring reasons people do stay Christian. And so now, as we wrap up our journey through this book, we come to the question of how. How do we do, do we do Christianity at this juncture in history? And the answer to that question, McLaren says, is another question. What kind of humans do we want to become? So this week, for your mentee poll, we'll, we'll do this one more time. Actually, we might do it again next week. Uh, For your mentee poll, if you open your bulletins and and use the QR code or go to the web address in the bulletin, your question to answer is, what kind of human do you want to be? What do you want to pass on to the next generation? How do you think humanity should grow and evolve to be the kinds of people God created us to be? So I'll give you a couple of minutes, put in your answer, we'll see the word cloud as best we can as it unfolds in front of us, and then I'll go on. Loving and kind are definitely the most popular answer so far. Let's see. Well, we've got caring, thoughtful, gracious, generous, Faithful, against racism and bigotry. Well, they're moving so fast I can't keep up with them today. Prayerful, inclusive, educated, non judgmental, offering hope. This is our vision, friends. 
As Christ followers, this is what we see of what the world might look like. This is the vision of the kingdom of God. Now, we tend to look at Scripture as, as Christ followers to help us understand what kind of people God asks us to be. McLaren uses Micah 6.8 as a way of framing what he has to say on the matter. He has told you, O mortal, what it is to be good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Just as you've said, be just, be kind, be humble. But we also can turn to the Sermon on the Mount, the most extensive teaching that Jesus gives us about how to live faithfully. Among the Beatitudes, Jesus includes that we are blessed when we are merciful, when we are humble and caring, when we seek righteousness, when we make peace. So despite the stories we've heard over the last weeks of the ways in which the church has sometimes behaved in op opposite ways, these are the teachings of our faith. These are the ingredients in creating the kingdom of God. And while they may seem simple enough, we all know how challenging they can be. So how do we continue to foster these characteristics in ourselves and maybe at this point in history, more importantly, how do we connect with others who share these same values so that we can be a counter-narrative in the world? McLaren starts his reflections on this by looking at different models of human development and faith development. He describes Father Richard Rohr's model just as two parts, the first half of life and the second half of life. In the first half of life, it's characterized by dualistic thinking that puts the world into categories to create order. Good, bad, us, them, safe, dangerous, friend, foe, winner, loser. And then in the second half of life, and he doesn't have an age at which this starts, it's sort of a gradual process. But in the second half of life, we begin to see the relationships and the connections between these seeming opposites. How good and evil can be so close to each other. How good intentions have unintended negative consequences. Eventually, we come to recognize how interrelated, interdependent, and interwoven each person and thing in the universe is with everything else. And it is in that larger reality where God is at work. McLaren has his own model for stages of development. He breaks down Rohr's two categories into four, simplicity, complexity, perplexity, and harmony. Again, the first two stages are characterized by dualism, while perplexity is that point at which we begin to doubt and question when we are not sure what we believe anymore. And harmony comes at the other side of that, at the point when we are able to look at the world holistically and look at ourselves and others with empathy. It is at that stage, of course, at which we are the best versions of ourselves. We get there in part by paying attention to our desires. What do we desire, and is it in alignment with the kingdom of God? Do we desire recognition, status, or wealth? Or do we desire the good of the planet and the good of all God's people? And can we put our own desire for well-being in the context of what is good for the planet and for others? Writes McLaren, in this light, to say I love you is to say that I give my heart to the divine love that loves in and through all creation. I am joining God in God's desire to relate to all creation as beloved. If we desire a thriving world for all as our deepest and most all-encompassing desire, not only will we have everything that we need, 
we will become the kinds of people who help create that kind of world. McLaren also introduces an idea he calls rewilding. And I love this particularly in this beautiful fall day. He talks about believing that by spending time in the wild, in nature, maybe hiking or canoeing, that kind of, be of behavior, we're able to put aside all the limitations that come with trying to fit our experience into words and into human constructs. We're simply open to the connection we have with creation and the rest of humanity. This may also help us to move out of our heads and into our hearts and our bodies. If we come to value our own bodies, we more easily value the bodies of others. So how might we rewild our theology and other aspects of our faith to celebrate the contributions and gifts of others? Similarly, how can we take some of the destructive ways in which scripture has been interpreted and theology misused and redeem them? Already there's been a shift in moderate and progressive churches away from a th theology that says you must be saved by the blood of Christ or you will go to hell to an understanding of salvation as liberation from whatever holds you back from a life of abundant love and joy. What other scripture passages or doctrine have been used to exclude, judge, or limit others that we need to wrestle with in order to make them holy and valuable and authentic to what Jesus taught? McLaren believes that not only Christians have this work to do, but other religions and secular organizations as well. It is the work of naming the beliefs which are harmful to humanity or to the earth and reinterpreting them in the light of the humans we want to become. In a similar way, McLaren says we must renounce doctrine and policies which are harmful within our institutions and announce that we're doing something different. An example of this is what we have done as a congregation around LGBTQ inclusion. We educated ourselves, and as a community, we decided that we would be inclusive and welcoming, even if our denomination was not. In what other areas of our community life do we have this work to do? In the midst of all of this, we also have to watch out for the biases that creep into our thinking. We all have them. McLaren says watching out for them is staying loyal to reality. The culture we live in and the beliefs seated deeply within us pull us towards seeing the world as we want to see it rather than how it really is. This not only impacts the integrity with which we live out our faith, but also how we see the future. As Richard Rohr puts it, saying yes to what is ironically, sets us up for what if. Right, writes McLaren, to see possibility in what is what faith is about, not merely seeing the seeds in the apple, but seeing the million apple orchards waiting to spring from those seeds. Therefore, if our bias is against anything that's new, we will never see what could be. If our bias is against inclusion, we will never benefit from the gifts of a diverse community. Which leads to the last of McLaren's ideas that I'll highlight here. McLaren sees civilization as at the end of an era and the beginning of something new. In his eyes, the old imperialistic values which drew the church away from the original teachings of Christ are dying off and humanity is entering into something new. If that's true, I suspect none of us will be alive once it's really here. <laughs> but I do believe that we, as Christ followers right here today, have the opportunity to reclaim the church and the Christian faith and a shape of future 
that reflects who God wants us to be, who we want to become, who we are when we embody the kingdom of God. Over and over in Scripture, we read that God is creating something new. In Isaiah, God says, I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And in Revelation, John tells us, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away, and the sea was no more. When we are faithful to who God asks us to be, humble, kind, just, merciful, we are a part of the big picture of work God is doing in the world. But we can't do it alone. We have to reach out to our neighbors, to other people of faith, to other community agencies, other people who want to create a just and kind world. And we need the church. We need each other. And so next week, I'm going to do one more sermon as an addendum to this series. We're hearing a lot about the troubles in the United Methodist Church right now as our denomination is slowly and painfully dividing. A lot of untrue things are being said about the United Methodist Church. And our time to finally officially separate won't come until 2024. And so next week, I'll take a little time to help you understand what's happening right now and to help you know why I will stay United Methodist. The sermon title will be, Do I Stay United Methodist? And I'll ask you this question. What kind of church do you want to be? May it be so. Amen.